Hi guys, welcome back to my vlogs. Um, today is part two of my Love Dare Challenge by Stephen and Al Alex Kendrick. Oh, we got a little person with us. Um, it is, if you've missed my first video, I will link it either here or at the end of the video. Um, but um, the last video will give you more information about introduction, ooh, bless you, of everything that it, this Love Dare Challenge is about. Alright, sorry about that. My co-host left me. Um, but today, this is start, starting on day four. The other three days, we we'll start off with Love is Patient, Love is Kind. And love is not selfish. Today is day four and it is love is thoughtful. And it says, how precious also are your thoughts to me. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. Psalms 139, 17 through 18. And it says, love thinks. It's not a mindless feeling that rides on waves of emotions and falls asleep mentally. It keeps busy in thought, knowing that loving thoughts perceive loving actions. When you first fell in love, being thoughtful came quite naturally. You spent hours, day, hours dreaming of what your loved one would look like, wondering what he or she was doing, rehearsing impressive things to say, then enjoying sweet memories of the time you spent together. You honestly confess, I can't stop thinking about you. And I put these in like little... I outlined it with it and said this could couldn't be more accurate or be more about me because that was definitely me <laughs> um, when I when I first fell in love with David. This next part is also very true. I highlighted it too. It says, but for most couples, things begin to change after marriage. The wife finally has her man, and the husband has a, his trophy. The hunt is over and pursuing done. Sparks of romance slowly burn into gray embers, and the motivation for thoughtfulness cools. You drift into focusing on your job, your friends, your problems, your personal desires, yourself. After a while, you unintentionally begin to ignore the needs of your mate. But the fact that marriage has added another person to your universe does not change. Therefore, if your thinking doesn't mature enough to constantly include this person, you catch yourself being surprised rather than thoughtful. Today's our anniversary. I didn't think I needed to consult you in that de decision. Why would that upset you? If you don't learn to be thoughtful and end up regretting missed opportuni opportunities to demonstrate love, thoughtfulness is a silent enemy to a loving relationship. Let's be honest, men struggle with thoughtfulness, thoughtlessness <laughs> more than women. And I highlight this next part. A man can focus like a laser on one thing for and forget the rest of the world. I have definitely have learned this in my um, few years of being married. Whereas this can benefit from him in that one arena, it make him overlook another things that need to his attention. A woman, I highlight this, on the other hand, is more multi-conscious, able to maintain an amazing awareness of many factors at once. She can talk on the phone, cook, know where the kids are in the house, and wonder why her husband isn't helping, all simultaneously. Adding to this, a woman also tends to think relationally. Yeah. When she works on something, she is cognizant Cognizant of all the people who are somehow connected to it. And this is me every single day. <laughs> Both of these tendencies are examples of God-designed women to complete their men. As God said at creation, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And that's in Genesis 2.18. But these differences also create opportunities for misunderstanding. Men, for example, tend to think in headlines and say exactly what they mean. Each, right, not much is needed to understand the message. 
His words are more literal and shouldn't be overanalyzed. But women often think and speak between the lines. They tend to hint. A man needs to listen for what is implied if he wants to get the full meaning. If a couple doesn't understand this about one another, the fallout can result in endless disagreements. And I've highlighted this. His frustrated, he's frustrated wondering why she speaks in riddles and doesn't just come out and say things. I can see David definitely thinking this. <laughs> She's frustrated wondering why he is so inconsiderate and doesn't add two and two together and just figure her out. I have felt that way. A woman deeply longs for her husband to be thoughtful is a key to helping her feel loved. I'll repeat that because I highlighted it. A woman deeply longs for her husband to be thoughtful is a key to helping her feel loved. When she speaks, a wise man will listen like a detective to discover the unspoken needs and desires her words simply imply. If, however, she always has to put the pieces together for him, it steals the opportunity for him to demonstrate that he loves her. This also explains why women will get upset with their husbands without telling them why. In her mind, she's thinking, I shouldn't have to spell it out for him. He should be able to look at the situation and see what's going on here. At the same time, he's grieved because he can't read her mind, and he wonders why he's being punished for a crime he didn't know he committed. Love requires thoughtfulness on both sides. The kind that builds bridges through the constructive combination of patience, kindness, and selfishness. I underlined that and I said, because I said uh, those are um, some of the things that we talked about in the last video. Patience, kindness, and selfishness. Love teaches you to meet in the middle to respect, appreciate how your spouse uniquely thinks. A husband should listen to his wife and learn to consider right of her unspoken messages. A wife should learn to communicate truthfully and not say one thing while meaning another, but it is easy to become angry and frustrated instead. Following the destructive pattern of ready, shoot, aim, you speak harshly now and determine later if you should, you should have said it. But the thoughtful nature of love reaches you to engage your mind before engaging your lips. Love thinks before speaking. It filters words through a grid of truth and kindness. When, the last, when was the last time you spent a few times thinking about how you could understand and demonstrate love to your spouse? And I said recently, um, now that I'm doing this um, challenge, um, what immediate need can you meet? What's the next event, anniversary, birthday, holiday you could be preparing for? Well, today's Christmas Eve, so tomorrow's Christmas. So I don't really have time to really prepare anything extravagant for those because I've already kind of done what I'm going to do. Um, and then there's New Year's Eve, but I really don't have any plans for that. We're kind of just kind of winging that one. So um, actually, before I was even read this on um, this day, this dev devotional, this challenge, I was, had already started thinking about Valentine's Day, so I'm preparing for that. Um, great marriages come from great thinking. Okay, this is today's dare. It says, contact your spouse sometime during the business of the day. Have no agenda other than asking how he or she is doing and if there is anything you could do for them. I actually started doing that last night. I can't call him because he doesn't go back to work until Thursday and today is Tuesday. Uh, but he hasn't really been David hasn't been feeling very well his back and legs have been hurting so um, I just been asking him whenever I can if or what he needs me to do to help him and so yeah um, that's what I'm doing for this dare and but I'm going to call him on Thursday and I will report back and that's going to be in the, probably in the next few days um and let you know what he says and or how he reacts to me asking me how he needs. And I'll just keep asking him every day. So, all right, stay tuned for the next one. Okay, day five, and it is love is not rude. 
He who blesses his friend with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be reckoned a curse to him. Proverbs 27, 14. Nothing irritates others as quickly as being rude. Rudeness is unnecessarily saying or doing things that are unpleasant for another person to be around. To be rude is to act unbecoming, embarrassing, or disrespectful. In marriage, this could be a foul mouth, poor table manners, or habit of making sarcastic quips. David sometimes has, he doesn't have a horrible um, foul mouth, but every once in a while he says things in front of James. I'm just like, okay, small ears, David. <laughs> they don't, he doesn't need to be hearing those kind of words. It's not like, again, it's not, he doesn't say like horrible, horrible words or anything, but ones that I, I prefer him not to say. He doesn't really consider them mm -hmm. curse words, but I grew up thinking they were curse words. So, um, I always tell David, okay, but let's not say those words. And, and we are, both of us are pretty sarcastic. So we both need to work on that too. Um, any way you look at it, no one enjoys being around a rude person. Rude behavior may seem insignificant to the person doing it, but it is unpleasant to those on the receiving end. As always, lo love has something to say about this. When a man is driven by love, he intentionally behaves in a way that's more pleasant for his wife to be around. If a woman desires to love her husband, she purposely avoids things that frustrate him or cause him discomfort. And I wrote to Saad that um, there is something that David doesn't like me saying while teasing him, so I try not to do it anymore. I, used to, <laughs> I didn't think it's that big of a deal. I'm not going to say what it is just because, one, David would be upset and I'm not going <laughs> to do that. But two, uh, I mean, I just, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I just did a little teasing fun, but he seems to get upset every single time I say, say it, so I try not to do it anymore. Um, the bottom line is genuine love minds its manners. Embracing this one concept could add some fresh air to your marriage. Good manners expressed to your wife or husband. I value enough to exercise self-control around you. I want you to be a person who, who's a pleasure to be with. When you allow love to change your behavior, even the smallest of ways, you restore an atmosphere of honor to your relationship. People who practice good etiquette tend to raise the respect of level and environment and people around them. And I um, underlined the people who practice good etiquette because I have been wanting to really work on this. I mean, I don't have, I don't feel like I have bad etiquette, but I want to be more, I don't say proper, but more, I guess a, a, a good thing would be like Christian-like. I mean, no, that sounds bad too. Like, I don't know. Just good etiquette in general. Um, for the most part, the etiquette used at home is much different than the kind that you employ with friends or even with total strangers. You may be barking or pouting around the house, but in the front door chimes. If but if the front door chimes, you open it with a kind, welcoming smile. If you dare to love, you'll also want to give your best to your own. If you don't let love motivate you to make some needed changes in your behavior, you will unnecessarily limit the quality and enjoyment level of your marriage relationship. The more respectful and honorable your behavior, the more attractive and romantically appealing you become to your spouse. Women to be much better at certain types of manners than men, since their femininity makes them naturally more gentle and elegant. Because men are drawn to people who show them respect, a woman's choice to lace her speech with respectful tones is very effective in winning her husband's heart, persuading him, and helping him to sense her love. 
In contrast, a wife can be very rude if she speaks down to her husband, ignores his decisions, or becomes argumentative. And I underlined that, and I said that, that I need to work on these. I don't... I don't do that often, like speak down to him. And I'm working on trying to always put his decision as the man of the house, and he... He gets to make the decisions, and I'm trying not to be as argumentative <laughs> with him either. So, King Solomon said, better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife, and that's in Proverbs 25, 24. But men especially need to learn the important lesson about manners. It is unloving to our wives to treat them like one of the guys, rather than as a lady we have chosen to love and prize above all others. A husband shows great strength when he honors his wife by practicing self-control rather than doing whatever he, f he feels compelled. The Bible says it is well with a man who is gracious, and that is Psalms 112.5. A man of discretion will find out what is appropriate, then address his behavior accordingly. There are two main reasons why people are rude. It is ignorance and self-centeredness. Neither, of course, is a good thing. A child is born ignorant of etiquette, needing lots of help and training. But a simple learning of basic etiquette can greatly help them learn direction. We adults, however, display our ignorance at another level. We know the rules, but we, are, we can be blind to how we write them or be too self-centered to care. In fact, we may not even realize how unpleasant we can be to live with at times. Test yourself with these questions. I'm supposed to ask myself these questions, but I actually went ahead and asked David these questions too. So, how does your spouse feel about the way you speak around them? My answer when I thought of it was, sometimes he thinks I do not speak down to him, but... Um, not make him feel like a, well, actually, I'll get to that in a second because it's actually one of the answers, but he says he thinks I'm fine. How does your behavior affect your main sense of worth and self-esteem? Again, I feel like sometimes maybe I don't really work on his self-esteem. I don't know, these are hard questions because I don't feel like I'm a bad at wife and I don't feel like I've ever intentionally done anything to make him feel less than he should, but um, it's hard to put into words. I know how, I feel it right here, but his answer was, for the most part, positive. Occasionally I make him feel like he needs to be a better person but he thinks that's what I was talking about earlier but he thinks it's because of his own issues to work out and I guess his own insecurities and he feels like he probably is close to the same with me or he has said things does the same to me <laughs> sorry he feels like he does the same to me but mostly positive I also ask how he is doing and um, he says, I also, also ask him how he's doing and how I can help, which I was kind of made me smile because that's what I've been working on, on this love dare is asking him. That was actually, was that the last one? The last one was, the dare was, sorry, I just had it. Contact your spouse something during the business day. Have no agenda other than asking how she's doing and if there's anything you could do for them. I haven't actually texted David because he actually just went to work. So I'm going to do that um, here in a little bit. But I do ask him throughout the day how he's doing, if there's anything I can do for him. So when he mentioned that, when with one of his answers, that made me smile. I'm like, oh, it's actually working. Uh, would your husband or wife say you're a blessing or that you're condescending and embarrassing? And I don't think I'm... Um, I think I'm a blessing, right? <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm ever condescending or embarrassing. If I am, I don't mean to be. He says I'm a blessing, pretty positive overall. 
And then it goes on to say, if you're thinking that your spouse, not you, is the only one who needs to work in this area, you're likely suffering from an undiagnosed case of ignorance with a secondary condition of self-centeredness. Remember, love is not rude, but lifts you to a higher standard. Do you wish your spouse would quit doing the things that bother you? I actually wrote, yes, of course, who wouldn't? But um, <laughs> then it's time, to, but then it goes on and I underlined it. Then it's time to start doing the things that bother them. Will you be thoughtful and loving enough to discover and avoid the behaviors that can cause life to be unpleasant for your mate? Will you dare to be delightful? Here are three guiding principles that it comes to practicing etiquette in your marriage. The first one is to guard the, guard the golden rule. Treat your mate the same way you would want to be treated. And that's in Luke 631. It said the C, Luke 631. So I looked it up and it says pretty much the exact same thing. Do to others as you would have them do to you. I think you learn that pretty much in like elementary school. But actually, I didn't realize that was a Bible verse until I started reading my Bible and everything. So, neat, huh? Um, number two, no double standards. Be as considerate to your spouse as you are to strangers, friends, and co-workers. Number three, honor requests. Consider what your husband or wife has already asked you to do or not to do. If in doubt, ask. And that takes us to today's dare. And I've already done it. So um, we can just go ahead and, and I can answer it. But it says, ask your spouse to tell you three things that cause him or her to be uncomfortable or irritated with you. You must do something without attacking them or justifying your behavior. This is from their perspective only. And I asked David this and it actually took him a long time to even think of anything and I actually kind of had to be like, well, since I've asked him these questions before like a year ago, because um, this is my second time going through it, even though, well, first time I didn't finish it. Um, but so I kind of gave him some like ideas, but they've kind of actually changed. He said they're not really the same anymore. But anyway, what he said was, okay, David. David had a hard time thinking of things that make him uncomfortable or irritate with me. I asked him about, about my cleaning, and he said that he doesn't expect me to do a lot right now because I am pregnant. But it does give him some anxiety sometimes. Um, and uh, David says it's a hard question to answer because since he has been in a lot of pain lately because he has neck and back and pain. Um, he gets irritated faster because of his pain and lack of sleep. Um, but then he also added in, he wants to vent to me sometimes and I do get offended or think he's picking on me sometimes when he starts saying stuff. It's usually about my cleaning and it upsets me because I already feel bad about it and I feel like a failure because I feel like as a wife I should be on top of things and clean and get everything done around the house and sometimes if it, something doesn't get done he might mention something about it and and it, I do get offensive about it because I feel like that's my own insecurities because I'm like oh okay I know I'm not doing good this and I was hoping he maybe wouldn't see it but apparently it does because he just mentioned it so um but yeah oh yeah and then this morning I seen that last night um and then this morning he came back up to me and he said oh there's one other thing you can add to your list and it is the our preferences on how we treat our dog Baxter well my, I guess it is, he's actually kind of more my dog, but um, he's the first animal I had that wasn't like a family animal. Like growing up, I always had like animals, and I'd be like, Oh, this is my animal, but in general, it's like the whole family's animal, even though was, I would say this was my dog or whatever. But oh, he heard his name. Hi, um, <laughs> so um. Sometimes I might be a little more lenient than David when it comes to Baxter. 
but or he thinks I let Baxter get away with a lot more than any of the other, other animals we have and I have another I have a cat that's kind of mine too um, but again Baxter's kind of was my first child <laughs> before I actually got married oh I actually my dog I had a dog and two cats before when I met David and um, unfortunately one of my cats passed away from cancer but um, I still have one cat and then Baxter and David always says that I put Baxter first and I let him get away with things that otherwise I wouldn't and, or shouldn't and then I hope this comes making sense but like today um, James was sleeping and Baxter was sneezing right outside the door and David got on to him and was like, he's just sneezing, David. And <laughs> and he was just like, yeah, but you're going to wake up your son. And I don't know, that's, that might be a, bad, be a bad example. But I don't know. I, it's just little things like that that apparently I let Baxter get away with that I shouldn't. But cats are different. I wonder if my cat was a dog, if he would say that about that. Did I treat the cat like that too? I don't know. All right, but that is the end of day five. And as soon as I did actually end up texting David this a few minutes ago, and I'll let you know how the dare of day four went. And I will see you on day six. Hi guys, welcome to day six. Before I get into six, I have some updates on the other ones. The first was the um, day number four, where I was supposed to call David or text David during the day and see how he's doing and um, see if there's anything I need to do for him while he was at work. I did that and first, the first thing he said was just that he was fine. He was, I mean, he was explaining what he was doing at work and how he was feeling. And then um, he said he couldn't really think of anything I needed for him, for me to do for him. Um, I think he appreciated it. Sorry if you can hear my dog, he's snoring <laughs> right next to me. The next one was the Love Dare. And um, Love Dare for on day five. Um, love is not rude. And I if you remember, well, just a second ago, that I asked David um, things that is irritable to him or make him uncomfortable and he really couldn't think of anything. And he actually thought of something else. Um, <laughs> he said there was two things. The first one was <clears throat> that he, it, it makes him irritable when I then the trash can's full I just keep putting stuff on top of it <laughs> and I know I'm not supposed to attack or say anything and justify my things but I did <laughs> I said well I wish you just put trash in the trash can so um, and he joked and he was like well it just it evens itself out because it just ends up on the floor either anyway because you just put it on the trash can and it falls out so I don't know <clears throat> anyway so um, I guess this is going to be an ongoing battle until <laughs> the whole trash situation. If you haven't heard before, in one of my other days, one of the things that made me irritable was that David doesn't put stuff in the trash. He just leaves it right next to the trash can. Anyway, um, and the other one was um, when we start having a serious conversation, or not really an argument, well, it could be an argument, um, I will just walk out of the room and not talk about or deal with it and I do that because I don't want to say I don't want to I don't want to do something I don't, say something that I would regret and that gives me time to relax or to think about it and cool off and David doesn't like it when I do that he rather just finish it um, then now and then, um, th he just wants to finish it then. And, um, so I think that 
makes him irritable when I just walk out of the room, but that's our differences when it comes to our disagreements and how we, how we deal with them. I guess we need to come to a, we've, we've had a conversation about it before, but I guess we just need to come to a happy medium for it. Okay, so that was an update on day four and five. Now it is day six, and it is love is not irritable. It says, He is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. That's in Proverbs 16, 32. Love is hard to offend and quick to forgive. And I wrote in that David is quick to, for, to, to forgive and I'm much more likely to hold a crutch. Um, he likes to say that he does get a little angry fast, but he forgets about or forgives easily and moves on with it faster. How easily do you get irritated and offended? Like I said, I think I hold, I, it take, it takes a lot for me to get irritated and offended, but once it does, I guess I hold grudges. <clears throat> Some people live by the motto, never pass up the opportunity, opportunity, never pass up an opportunity to get upset with your spouse. That just sounds horrible to me. I don't like that. When something goes wrong, they quickly take full advantage of it, expressing how hurt or frustrated they are. By this is the opposite reaction of love. To be irritable means to be near the point of a knife, not far from being poked. People who are irritable are locked, loaded, and ready to overreact. And I wrote in, David occasionally makes me feel this way but lately it's been mostly James I guess I get irritable and well he's three so I guess I get a little don't have a lot of patience sometimes because he just does the same thing over and over and I feel like he's doing it to make me mad but I know he's not meaning to make me mad just being three if you don't have a three-year-old if you've never been around three-year-olds they're very Stubborn. Well, let's just put it there. Okay. Um, I think they're worse than people always say terrible twos are the worst. I think threes are. Okay. When under pressure, love doesn't turn sour. Minor problems don't yield major reactions. The truth is, love does not get angry or hurt unless there's a legitimate and just reason inside of God. And that's really hard for me to take in. Wow. Okay. Let me read it again. Love does not get angry or hurt unless there's a legitimate and just reason in the sight of God. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's a powerful sentence for me. A loving husband will remain calm and patient, showing mercy and restraining his temper. David needs to work on this. With James, um, I was. It does say rage and violence are out of the question, and I have to say that James, David, does never get never gets violent with David. Or David never gets violent with James. But I think all parents lose their calm and patience and get angry with their children at times. <clears throat> A loving wife is not overly sensitive or cranky, but exercises emotional self-comfort she chooses to be a flower among the thorns and respond pleasantly during prickly situations I definitely need to work on this I try to work daily on it but yeah if you're walking under the influence of love you will be a joy not a jerk ask yourself am I calming breeze am I calming breeze or am I storm way to happen and I wrote that I'm kind of in the middle. I think just being a mom, you sometimes I can. <clears throat> sorry, I got allergies. Um, I think um, 
can calm when James is upset or David's, David's upset. I think I can calm him down. But at the same time, if it's just so much going on and I'm stressed out and tired, I could definitely blow up like a storm. Why do people become irritable? There are at least two key reasons to contribute to it. It says, first, stress. And I believe this is what David and I both have is stress. Um, stress wears you down, drains your energy, weakens your health, and invites you to be cranky. It can be brought on by relational causes, arguing, division, and bitter bitterness. There are also there are also excessive causes, overworking, overplaying, and overspending. And I wrote in that David, he um, definitely overworking. He works two jobs just so I can stay home and be a stay-at-home mom and wife. So I think that definitely is a stress on him, especially when he having his neck and back pain. Um, then there's deficiencies, not getting enough rest, nutrition, or exercise. David and I both need to work on these. The exercise and nutrition, we both need to work on that. But on enough rest, <laughs> uh, David and I, we're about to have a newborn and have a toddler. A toddler who sometimes, or actually a lot, almost, almost every night wakes up in the middle of the night crying. Um, and David has a hard time sleeping because of his neck and back pain. And it's hard for him to get comfortable at night. So we're going to have a newborn. David's not going <laughs> to feel well and can't get comfortable asleep. And we have a toddler who doesn't sleep. So... That's something that's definitely going to bring on stress and make us irritable because we don't get enough rest. Um, then keep going on. Oftentimes we inflict these daggers on ourselves and th th this sets us up to be irritable. Life is a marathon, not a sprint. This means you must balance, prioritize, and pace yourself. Too often we throw caution to the wind and run full steam ahead, doing what feels right at the moment. Soon we are gasping for air, wound up in knots, and ready to snap. The increasing pressure can wear away at our patience and our relationships. The Bible can help you avoid unhealthy stress. It teaches you to love God your relationship so that you aren't caught up in unnecessary arguments. And that's in Colossians 3, 12 through 14. To pray through your anxieties instead of tackling them on your own. And I underlined that because I do try to do this. I try to pray through my anxieties. When I'm starting feeling anxiety, I start praying to God about it. And that's in Philipp Philippians 4, 6, 7. Oh, I hear a little three-year-old coming in. Hi, James. Um, To delegate. Yes, please. It's going to be days and prizes too. And Alex, okay, let going? mommy. Mommy's doing a video. She's reading. Hey. Hi, say hi. Hi. Okay, here. Let mommy finish. So, I just got the book and give one book. Okay, I'm gonna take a small break and I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, where was I? To delegate when you're overworked, and that's Exodus eighteen seventeen through twenty three. To avoid overindulgence, and it's Proverbs 25, 16. If he also exhorts you in to take sa a Sabbath day every day for worship and rest. And I try to do this on Sundays. I do try to do everything I need to do around the house and get everything done. And then Sundays, I try to days, I just try to rest and relax. This strategically allows you time to recharge, refocus, and add margin to, or breathing room to your weekly schedule. By establishing, establishing these breaks and extra spaces, you will place cushions between you and your pressures around you. Reducing the stress that keeps you on edge around your mate <laughs> or your child. <laughs> but there is a second deeper reason why you become irritable, selfishness. When you're irritable, the heart of the problem is primarily a problem of the heart. 
Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 12, 34. Some people are like lemons. When life squeezes them, they pour out a sour response. Some are more like peaches. When the pressure is on, the result is still sweet. Being easily angered is an indicator that a hidden area of selfishness or insecurity is present where love is supposed to rule. And I underlined insecurity because both David and I both have insecurities. But selfishness also wears many of other masks. Lust, for example, is the result of being ungrateful for what you have and choosing to covet or burn with a passion for something that is forbidden. When your heart is lustful, it will become easily frustrated and angered. That's in James 4, 1 through 3. Bitterness takes root when you respond in a judgmental way and refuse to work through your anger. A bitter person's unresolved anger leaks out when he is provoked. And that's Ephesians 4, 31. Greed. And I underlined that and I said, I do have a, a little greed. I, um, but I don't know if it's... If I know someone who isn't a little, have, has greed, who doesn't have greed. Um, because who doesn't want more money? And that was the next thing I was going to say. It says, it says, greed for more money and possessions will frustrate you and be unfulfilled desires. First Timothy 6, 9 through 10. I mean, who doesn't, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but who doesn't want more money to more money <laughs> I mean I know money it does isn't supposed it doesn't make you happy but I do feel like it does make life easier even though some people you live to what you have like yeah how, does that make sense like if you have money what money you have that's how you live like if you don't have hardly any money but you're still you're living what's how was it called I can't think of the word that I'm looking for, but it's, you're going to live to what you live on, what you make. So millionaires are most of the time going to live on their millions. It's not some, some save their money and smart about it, but then middle class are going to, I don't know. That's not really coming out right, but I hope you can kind of understand what I'm saying. Anyway. <laughs> That might have not made any sense at all, but we're going to keep going. Um, I know what I'm trying to say in my head. Um, these strong cravings coupled with dissatisfaction lead you to lash out at anyone who stands in your way. Then there's pride. Pride leads you to act harshly in order to protect your ego and reputation. And I wrote, I have issues with that too. I probably care too much what other people think of me. So I get prideful when I feel like I have to protect my ego and re reputation. Fear of embar embarrassment. That's another one. I, I don't like to be. Um, embarrassment causes a reaction. These motivations can never be satisfied. But when love enters your heart, it claim calms you down and inspires you to quit focusing on yourself. To, it loosens your grasp and helps you let go of unnecessary things. Love will lead you to forgive instead of holding a grudge. To be grateful instead of greedy. To be content rather than rushing into more debt. And I underlined that. I'll, I'll say it again. To be grateful instead of greedy. To be content rather than rushing into more debt. Love encourages you to be happy when someone else succeeds rather than lying awake and not in envy. Love says, says share the inheritance. Rather than fight with your relatives. <laughs> it reminds you to prioritize your family rather than sacrifice them for a promotion at work. And I wrote in that I think that's one of the, a big one of the reasons people need to remember and work on. Anyway, that's that's just something I think about uh, that I feel like that a lot of people put their family on the back burner just to get a promotion at work. And that's something I'm pretty against. Maybe that's why I'm a stay-at-home mom. 
In, in each decision, love ultimately lowers your stress and helps you release the venom that can build up inside. It then sets up your heart to respond to your spouse with patience and encouragement rather than anger and, and ex exasperation. And today's dare was, choose today to start reacting through circumstances in your marriage with love instead of irritation. Begin by making a list below of errors where you need to add margin to your schedule. Then list any selfish motivations that you need to release from your life. And I wrote, sorry, I got to readjust. Um, I feel like I'm not a very selfish person. Sometimes I do feel like I could work on and add to my schedule is to wake up earlier and not sleep in. That's not really adding margin to where I need to relax, though, is it? Oh, well, I'll keep going with what I wrote. <laughs> um, by doing this, I would probably get more done throughout the day, such as Bible study, cleaning, and working out, like I've been wanting to do more and more, ha um, having more me time. I guess that's more the margin of me relaxing because... I need more me time. It's pretty much, I wake up now right before day, James does or right after. And it's just James, James, James all day and I never have me time. That's pretty much what I said. I said, I've been wanting to do more of those for more me time in the morning before James wakes up. I think I could get more things done around the house and I would have more quality time for David and James. And we would all be less stressed, but I am trying to juggle that and thought I haven't, or I thought I won't be sleeping much more before the baby gets here. So I should get as much sleep as I can now, but I have also have so much I need to get done before the baby gets here. It's a real struggle for me. I need to consult with David more about it. So yeah. I want to get get up um, I want to get up earlier and get stuff done and have my me time before James gets here or James gets here before the baby gets here no way I was right the first time <clears throat> I want to have to get up in the morning and have my me time before James wakes up but at the same time, I want to be able to get all the sleep I can in but before the baby gets here because I'm not going to be able to sleep once the baby gets here. So it's just something that I'm juggling and tossing around trying to figure out. If you got any ideas, throw them <laughs> this way. <laughs>